My pensive Sarah, thy soft cheek recline thus on mine arm, most soothing and sweet it is, to sit beside our cot, our cot overgrown with white flowered jasmine and the broadleaf myrtle, meet emblems they of innocence and love, and watch the clouds that late were rich with light, slow saddening round, and mark the star of Eve, serenely brilliant, such would wisdom be, shine opposite. How exquisite the scents snatched from yon bean field, and the world so hushed, the silly murmur of distant sea tells us of silence. And that simplest lute, placed lengthways in the clasping casement, hark, how by the desultory breeze caressed, like some coy maid half yielding to her lover, it pours such sweet upbraiding as much needs tempt to repeat the wrong. And now its strings boldly are swept, the long sequacious notes over delicate, delicious surges sink and rise, such a soft floating witchery of sound as twilight elfins make, when they at eve voyage on gentle gales from fairyland, where melodies round honey-dropping flowers footless and wild like birds of paradise, nor pause, nor perch, hovering on untamed wing. Oh, the one life within us and abroad, which meets all motion and becomes its soul, a light and sound, a sound like power and light, rhythm in all thought, and joyance everywhere. Methinks it should have been impossible not to love all things in a world so filled, where the breeze warbles in the mute still air is music slumbering on her instrument. And thus, my love, as on the midway slope of yonder hill I stretch my limbs at noon, whilst through my half-closed eyes I behold the sunbeams dance, like diamonds on the main, and tranquil muse upon tranquility. Full many a thought uncalled and undetained, and many idle flitting fantasies traverse my indolent and passive brain, as wild and various as the random gales that swell and flutter on this subject loop. And what if all of animated nature be but organic harps diversely framed, and that tremble into thought and o'er them sweep, plastic and vast, one intellectual breeze, at once the souls of each, and God of all? But thy more serious eye a mild reproof darts, O beloved woman, nor such thoughts dim and unhallowed dost thou not reject, and biddest me walk humbly with my God? Meek daughter in the family of Christ, well hast thou said and holily dispraised, these shapings of the unregenerate mind, bubbles that glitter as they rise and break on vain philosophy's eye babbling spring, for never guiltless may I speak of him, the incomprehensible, save when with what awe I praise him, and with faith that inly feels, who with his saving mercies healed me, and sinful and most miserable man, wildered and dark, and gave me to possess peace and this cot and thee, heart honored maid. Uh, hey guys, so. This poem is written by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and it is an old poem, and he wrote it over a couple of years, and so you can see his evolution as of his thoughts regarding uh, different aspects of life. And so the title of the poem is The Aeolian Harp, which is used as a metaphor for the human mind. And the Aeolian Harp is an instrument um, that looks like a box and it has strings inside and it works when wind blows through it so instead of being played by a human it is played by the forces of nature so in the first stanza the speaker addresses the audience directly and the audience is Sarah which happens to be the speaker's wife and so because this sounds like narration it is very possible that the speaker is the author himself. And so in this stanza, the speaker is talking to his wife, Sarah, and he talks about how brilliant and how beautiful life is. And he just, he feels at peace and he is with her at their cottage. So, um, um, this the cottage is there symbolizing that their marriage and the possibility of the future but also the beauty of their present okay and in the next two slides is one stanza and so this one very large stanza um, the aeolian harp is introduced and so, um, the Aeol so it is explained that just like the Aeolian harp is played by the forces of nature, um, the speaker's mind will 
develop these thoughts, these vivid thoughts and just pure happiness when he is stimulated by nature around him. And so he says that he goes on a voyage um, to a fairy land. So whenever he sits down and he looks at the beauty of life, he in his mind travels to a fantasy world and so this slide is just a further el elaboration on how much he fantasizes over the beauty of life. So this next stanza, um, the speaker addresses Sarah again and he is sitting with him on a hill. And so this is a very kind of romantic setting and so he is looking at the sea and he compares it to diamonds and um so again that's him taking something that's natural and emphasizing its beauty by comparing it to something that is not natural so because obviously the water would not be made out of diamonds but he is comparing it to diamonds and so, again, this is similar to the Aeolian harp in that he looks at something and he fantasizes about it. He, um, he makes it into something bigger, something more beautiful. And so the top of this next slide is the shortest stanza in the whole poem. And so... This is in the future in which the speaker um, addresses God for the first time in the poem. And so he is thinking that maybe God doesn't want us to rejoice so extremely in nature around us. And so he's, it's kind of a shift changer in tone and he is holding back he snaps back into reality and he says oh maybe i shouldn't be freaking out this much over the beauty of nature and so in this um concluding stanza sarah and the speaker are are talking and so Sarah kind of um, dismisses the speaker at like sh she doesn't see things as he does and so she's not as optimistic she doesn't really see the beauty in it or if she does see the beauty in it she doesn't have um, that creativity to expand the beauty of physical nature to um, just sit there and dream about um, a fantastical world um, that's related to the world that they're perceiving. And so, <clears throat> um, and so Coolridge talks about God again and saying like, oh, um, maybe Sarah is right, and maybe this is what God wants. He doesn't want people to really rejoice in life that much. And so he kind of, this is when he really, um, tracks back and he changes his mind and he tells himself not to be so happy about things. So now we're going to go over soapstone and so soapstone um so let, let's do speaker um the speaker is a man who is in love with this woman and he also kind of um cares about what god thinks of him and he likes to dream and think about life and it, the beauty of life so the occasion is um, this man is with his wife and in different 
at different times on different places. Um, at first it's the cottage, and later it's on the hill. <clears throat> and he is just dreaming about life. And so the audience is Sarah, um, Coleridge's wife. And the purpose is that you really shouldn't get carried away with the fantasy of life and face reality on a um, more normal basis. So he wants readers to understand this and he wants Sarah to understand that too. And so the subject is um, one that needs to direct their love of life um, to the way that God intended for us to do. And so the tone um, at the beginning is ebullient and kind of whimsical and very dreamy, very excited. And then at the later, um, later stands as he is more collected and um, level-headed. And he's also more, he's restraining his joy back more. <clears throat> 